Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode with the Psych and Tea Group. Today, we wanted to talk about a very relevant issue that's impacting the entire healthcare system as a whole. You guys might already know where we're going with this. We're talking about the pandemic. And specifically, we want to talk about how it's impacted the mental health care scene, all the way from nursing schools to nurse practitioners and the future of psychiatry. Once again, we are the Curious Psych NP, the Psych NP, and life of a Psych NP. And to start it off, I wanted to kind of just talk about the current barriers and struggles that we have in the mental health world right now, or actually in, in the healthcare in general. So I wrote a course uh, last year talking about how uh, mental health has been impacted due to recent events. And what I found was pretty interesting, guys. And I don't know if you guys might be able to relate to some of this, but um, I found that healthcare workers definitely are one of the higher risk groups for developing yeah, for sure. mental health issues as a result of everything going on, which is, you know, it, it makes sense, right? Because they're being exposed to it more and more. Frontline workers in particular, and actually nurses more so than doctors, which for sure. I see that, right? Because nurses are with the patients like what, 12 hours a day and the doctor just kind of comes in and out, right? So frontline workers are more impacted than say like administration or like medical billing staff or anything like that. Um, something I found really interesting while I was doing my research was this um, concept of moral injury. Have you guys ever heard of it before? Briefly, briefly. Can briefly, you explain? Yeah. So for those of you guys who might not know, so moral injury is actually a concept that comes from the military. And it's when you experience psychological distress as a result of being forced to make ethically or morally ambiguous choices. So in this context, it would be like a nurse being forced to choose who gets oxygen or maybe the doctor is choosing which patient gets oxygen. I mean, that's a terrible choice to make. And it's a lot different from compassion fatigue where compassion fatigue is everybody, like every nursing student's done a report on this. So it's, you know, the, you see so much suffering and then you get burnt out and you just don't care about anything anymore. So it's different than that. So I think in light of current events, moral injury has really come up as a hot topic. Have you guys ever experienced anything like that, moral injury? Mm, not necessarily. I think it's going to be have, it's more probably prevalent within the hospital setting just because that's where all the resources are mostly allocated to. Being in the outpatient setting, we're not necessarily given all of those choices or decision making uh, opportunities. So it's definitely one of those things that I think is geared more towards that avenue just because we're dealing with mental health. Uh, obviously, with one of the settings that I work in, the crisis stabilization, a lot of patients um, may not be shipped out to different hospitals because there's so many different patients within the inpatient things. And we, we're kind of stuck just holding patients regardless of the suicidal, um, regardless of if they're extremely psychotic and we're not given as many resources with our facility compared to inpatient facilities. So they're, once their hold ends, it's, we're so limited, can't even rewrite another hold because technically they have to go to a 14 day hold and then that just opens up another worm. So we're just stuck either having them voluntary or we just have to discharge them with the medications that we started there. And that kind of leads to a whole nother dilemma just because of the pandemic within itself and how it's impacting the larger hospital, larger inpatient units or the larger standalone um, psychiatric facilities. So I think that's totally that counts. I think that totally counts here. You're being forced to make these decisions, you know, like, you know, your patients aren't getting the best care possible because they're just oh, yeah, for sure. logistically, there's, there's no way to do it. Yeah, sure. But then I think it's not the same dilemma as oxygen. I think that's mental health is, has its own realm of how it impacts everything. Then serious things like oxygen, uh, saline or whatever medications, or I guess the vaccine speak now, of who are they deciding who's going to get the vaccine and who's not going to get the vaccine, right? Yes, they say healthcare workers are getting the vaccines first, but you'll notice a lot of these upper head people that don't even see patients, they're getting the vaccines first before the ER folks. So you kind of have, to, it's weird in that and how everything plays out. I guess a lot of it is just going to be politics at the end of the day and <laughs> who they see is more important. Yeah. So that's something that 
it's pretty unethical, but at the same time, it's as nurses, we don't really have as much control over that specific. I, but I think that that's the point, though. The fact that we don't have that much control, we're like cogs in the machine. I mean, I know for myself personally, during this whole thing, I've been burnt out several times just because I'm so frustrated that there's so little I can do to like help my patients and like just all the coping skills I'll tell my patients to go practice, they can't, right? They can't go exercise, they can't go on a trip, they can't do anything, and I can't escape it either. <laughs> so. I mean, what would have you guys like experienced that? Have you guys been feeling burnt out at all? Um, I think it's a look. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, uh, yeah. I think in, in a way, like I've been really lucky to avoid this kind of scenario, right? I'm, I'm working outpatient, um, but the thing is, for me, you know, I, I added another provider. So in terms of maybe like turning away some possible patients, you know, versus you know, I've been able to really take everybody in. And I think with making you know telepsychiatry kind of the, the new norm. I've been able to kind of expand my uh, availability for people before it'd be like a 10, 15 mile radius. So now I can really technically take in a lot more people. Obviously it depends on once I become full, then I won't be able to help more people. But luckily I've been kind of fortunate. Um, but in a way, like what you were saying, uh, Joyce, it, it definitely impacts a lot of things. I mean, self-care, coping skills, I and mean, these are all, everyone's really you know, getting the brunt of it right now. Um, and obviously right now, hopefully there's like some silver lining and it's you know finally starting to get a little bit better. But right now, it still doesn't seem that way. Would you say that you've seen an influx of patients that are that were once stable and now unstable? Oh yeah, I, I would. I mean, you know, there are some people that you know. They, I guess, in terms of you know, they like to be by themselves. They get to spend time with family. I, I definitely remember at the beginning when COVID really uh, started. Uh, that was at the beginning of the pandemic, and people were saying, oh, "I get to spend more time with my family." You know, I get to spend, but then I've also seen the, the negatives now. And I think now it's like, oh, I'm stuck with this person every day. My kids are, you know, not going to school and, and, and it's impacting them significantly. Um, or they can't do the same things like going out to the restaurants. You know, like we're, we're social people, right? So people can't do the things that they used to love. Um, and right now it's winter time here in Maryland. So people are just stuck in, in the house even more. Um, but what about you, Joyce? Have you seen anything? Oh my gosh, I, it was, yeah. Absolutely. So I work a lot with the severely mentally ill population and it was just so frustrating because like just as soon as we were making progress in the treatment, COVID, COVID hit, right? And then it just set everything back and everybody's so much more psychotic, everybody, you know, the mood swings, agitation, you know, all those maladaptive coping behaviors is just went back to square one and even like negative one for some people so that was really frustrating something i've also realized and i think there's some recent articles on this is how much it's been impacting the children you know adolescents who are in school right because all of a sudden you're going from in-person school to completely remote learning or a hybrid of both and i don't know i don't know about you guys but i do not do well with online learning i like just words on the screen i can't i can't do it and so now you you know these kids are anxiety depression you know they need that social connection with people right if we're talking about like erickson stages you know of what is it called erickson um it is development yeah, 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 yeah. Theory of development or whatever, right? The adolescence is why, like, independence versus, um, it's like rule something. But basically, they need a lot of social connection. It's, it's part of their growth, and they're not getting any of that. So you're getting a lot of missing assignments. People who used to be straight A students are now failing all their courses. You know, like, I have so many more people coming to my office asking um, to be put on like ADHD medication because they've just never had to deal with this kind of environment before. Right. And it could, I, I, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. You're good. So I, I feel like it kind of puts us in a pity because it's like we want to be able to help children thrive, but at the same time, don't want to wrongly diagnose someone with ADHD. Um, but at the same time, it's like, what else can we do in order for them to enhance kind of their grades or do something in the meantime, whether it's temporary or long term, if we're going to be putting someone on medication and then you come up with all these risks and then you have to go through the risk benefits, see what the alternatives are. And then you can recommend alternatives such as like biofeedback, such as going to therapy. But at the same time, it's like, oh, I'm just going to end up doing Zoom again for my therapy sessions. And then it just kind of goes all again. <laughs> it's the same thing. It's just like a circle. It's like you're just going to end up back. And then now you're just going to end up having to do more because you have to do schoolwork, you have to do your homework, you have to go to therapy now through Zoom. And that's kind of, it's just forever revolving door and you're just not going to want to do it. And even if you do supplement medications within it, 
how like how can we really tell if it's going to work or not because everyone metabolizes medications differently or side effects involved in medication and it's really tough to tell and unfortunately we're kind of in a situation where we're getting way more patients than we need to so instead of these month long visits like or every month visits it's going as every two month visits or every month visits and then parents can't necessarily even tell themselves because they're probably dealing with like burnout and like self care issues so now they're having to make their irritable anxious or whatever they may be and then it's it's crazy that's pretty much what it is <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's definitely a slippery slope, right? You talked about how it affects the children and adolescents, and then it affects their parents in a way, right? They're all, everyone, most likely everyone's working. And then now they have to play the role of teacher. You know, obviously the teachers are still teaching, but then, you know, yeah, they have to make sure that their, their kids know how to set up the Zoom or how, how to use their homework or how to do, like, the time management. So everything kind of just plays a role, like you said, it's that circle. You know, it impacts everybody. And that's just from, like, the education side. And then, not, you know, again, we talk about self-care. And we talk about, you know, the home is supposed to be a place where you relax. Well, now, you know, now home is school, now home is work. You know, where do you kind of, you know, separate home from, you know, being able to relax and enjoy things? And how do you kind of set your boundaries? It's pretty difficult in that sense. I think it's just the pandemic in general is kind of causing issues, not only for children, but I think more so even in our profession, right? Nursing school. I think that's the biggest thing is where we learn everything at the hands-on. We learn all of our skill, put an IV, how to do a Foley, how to be able to make a bed, how to be able to change someone, give someone a bed bath, things like that. We actually have to go in person and learn all of these skills. Now it's nursing school, is everything's through Zoom. Um, I have a few patients um, that I'm treating that are going through nursing school and they're doing their clinicals through Zoom. Like, how are you really learn all of these things? And then it just brings up the topic and like, how is it gonna impact the future of healthcare, especially when nurses are the COVID or the pandemic nurses are learning all of their skills. Like you're not gonna learn how to put an IV. You're not gonna, all of these essential skills that we have to know, like it's our bread and butter when coming out of nursing school. And now they're just graduating them because they pass all of their classes, the visual inspection on how to verbalize how to do something. But there's a difference, in my opinion, there's a difference between um, verbalize something, how a skill is done, as opposed to doing it. Like you can read online how to swim. You can read all these articles on how to swim and verbalize, oh, I need to move my arm, kick my feet, do all of these things. But if you, in a real situation, is that really going to help you? Maybe it might for a little bit, but long term, you have to physically do it over and over again, I think, to be impactful. And I think starting to affect nurse practitioner schools also because us going to clinicals is kind of where we get observed, we get to shadow, see patients, talk to patients, and do all of those things that make us bench practitioners. And that's kind of where we're starting to struggle because a lot of these things are happening through Zoom. So you're not necessarily learning how to do aims. You're not necessarily learning how to look certain behaviors because all you can see is their shoulders up for the patient. And if that, some settings you don't even see the patients, you're just talking to them on the phone. And it's like, I feel like it's gonna definitely screw up a lot of things in the future. Um, obviously book wise, maybe they'll be good, but uh, actual skill wise, I think it's gonna be a lot different. What do you guys think? Oh, I absolutely agree. I just had my student come out uh, into the field with me yesterday and it was his first time out in the field. The entire last semester we were doing it over video chat because we weren't allowed to go out into the field. And he said that it was a completely different experience. Actually talking to a patient one-on-one -on -one is totally different. You know, you, you get to do like a true mental uh, status exam, right? You get to see if they're malodorous, you get to see where their homes look like, the, the environment that they live in, the people that they're around, you know, the it's, it's totally different. Just building that rapport over somebody over a screen versus um, like in person, I think it's totally different. I, I know, I know they say that like, oh, um, you know, telehealth is, you can still build rapport with a patient over a screen. And for some people, maybe, but I really do find that in, that in-person assessment really brings a whole nother layer than just virtually, me personally. I, I think specifically in the SMI population, for sure, for sure. Um, I think in different populations where they're just stable or just have your normal generalized anxiety, depression, that's fine because they have bubs, they probably have the, they go to school or whatever they may be, but they're still able to kind of do things normally. 
but the SMI population, that's a whole different ball game that you kind of Especially have to Especially if you're already paranoid it. about electronics. <laughs> for sure. It's so hard to get them on sure. the screen. Yeah. yeah, for sure. Yeah, I mean, on my side, just like precepting students, right? So my first ever student was all in person. Um, and then I had a transition when the pandemic kind of started and you know, I had to do uh, virtual. And my second and third student had to do all virtual for the most part. And I, I don't know, I just to me, it felt like it was harder for me to, you know, to teach them you know, in between these calls and, you know, being them in person, they're right by my side. I can, you know, it, it just felt different for me. And I think for them, they kind of also impacted them. You know, they were still trying to learn, they're doing the best they could, but they were on you know, like an unfortunate situation. It wasn't ideal. You know, and I think nowadays, you know, this pandemic has expedited tele telepsychiatry to kind of be at the top. You know, before people are doing in-person appointments, that was number one. But right now, telepsychiatry is probably number one. You know, people are doing more of these, you know, virtual appointments. And before, telepsych jobs are only available for people for if you have two or three years of experience as a psych MP. But nowadays, it's kind of becoming the norm, right? Because things change. And, you know, obviously right now, you know, COVID or you know, this pandemic, the way it is, it, it changes a lot of things. And you know, going going forward, you know, I think telepsych is going to be the norm. Uh, and I think also in person will probably hopefully when 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 this pandemic resolves and this vaccines you know happen, that you know everyone can start doing everything that they want to do before. But right now, telepsychiatry is is really kind of the norm. Yeah, for sure. I think it's definitely going to be a moving forward. Um, but still, I think in different populations, it's it's tough. It's not only tough for us as providers. I think it would be tough for patients also, um, like like uh, the curious psych MP mentioned for paranoid patients, especially if they don't like electronics as a whole. That, that's a whole different ballgame. Like a lot of these patients, what you'll notice is they'll tend to not necessarily lie about their symptoms, but they won't tell you about everything. And then you can tell based off of their behaviors when you see them in, in person, as opposed to camera or through their uh, through the phone. So it's a whole different ball being able to kind of assess a patient properly um, and then being able to see them and how they're doing in their element um, or in person as opposed to uh, just seeing them through telepsych or through the phone. And you can, you can kind of tell how they are, if they're stable or not, when you see them in person as opposed to over the phone because of their behaviors, how they present. And then you can understand if they're actually even taking their medication, how the severity of their illness is and if they have actually good insight on their illness so tough in that sense for just having to be doing things purely telepsych as opposed to having these in-person um, visits yeah guys so the one thing is these physical initial appointments it's it's a little bit different right because now studies have shown uh, that when we do telephone call appointments you know let's say someone doesn't want to do or they can't do a virtual appointment telephone appointments are the shortest you know so Generally, these appointments, instead of lasting maybe an hour for an initial eval, might only last 40 minutes. Or if it's a follow-up for a general 20, 30-minute appointment, it might last five minutes, seven minutes. I mean, it changes now. And then when you do a virtual appointment, it's also shorter uh, than an actual physical in-person appointment. So even like, not to say quality of care is changing, but also it just changes the, the whole dynamic of the appointment. I mean, for mm -hmm. telephone calls, if you can't see the patient, it's just, it's, it maybe feels more impersonal, right? The virtual appointment, it's still, you know, at least you get to see them visually. But again, it's also different. But then in person, it just, again, it just feels more personable. Uh, and it, again, you know, hopefully down the line, we can kind of, kind of go back to these in-person appointments. But right now, telepsychiatry is kind of, kind of doing it. You just reminded me of something. I just had a patient and um, I also work with a homeless population, right? So nobody has a smartphone. So I, I, the, most of my assessments are done over the phone. So I was seeing this guy over the phone for several months and he was like, oh, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine, whatever. And then um, randomly, he told me like, oh, he was in and out of the hospital like five times and he couldn't give me a clear story on what was going on. So finally, I actually went out to see him in person. And this guy was completely distended, completely swollen. Like his abdomen was so huge. He had like a like a tumor or something growing on his stomach. And he couldn't even walk. He could barely stand, you know. And so I was like, what is going on? And he's like, oh, yeah. They told me I need to get a bunch of fluid drained out and I never went back. And it's been three months. <laughs> oh my God. Wow. We need to get you to a hospital. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, you know, it's, it's like stuff like that. They don't tell you over the phone. They, they don't even know what's going on. They don't know enough. And unless you can actually see them in person, like, you know, the quality, I, I personally think like the quality of care you can possibly give over the phone is, is very, very limited. And unless the patient is extremely self aware, has a lot yeah. of insight. I mean, even then. Um, you know, you so, need that, you need the eye, 
I think. Yeah, I agree. And and when they already like a lot of people are already hesitant to go into the hospital or go into seeking medical care because they're scared of the outcome and scared of what was might pop up. So they're just going to prolong it, prolong it. And if and over the phone, they're just going to tell us what we want to hear. Unless you continue to probe and probe at the same time, it's like it's so limiting because we don't necessarily get to talk to them to their face and. It's just tough because they're just going to end up telling what we want, and then we're just going to be like, okay, fine, everything looks good, and just move on. And then next month, same thing. As long as that previous month was good, this month's good again, and it's going to continue on. And sooner or later, it's going to go to like, oh, you just want to do three month appointments now. <laughs> next thing you know, they're dead. It's like, oh, what happened? And and you thought that you were treating them well, you're doing all the things you need to do, you're asking all the right questions. You're following up with their plan of care, what the future,、uh, asking about their coping mechanisms, what coping skills they've used to kind of relieve the symptoms, and then everything's good. But then physically, everything's wrong. That's tough in that sense. The one thing, guys, I also noticed though with this whole telepsych, oh, well, positive, right? Is that you know before people have to come in person to your office, right? So they have to drive there, they have to set some time. You know now, you know virtual, it, it makes everything more accessible for everybody. So that changes a lot of things. I, even for my practice, I've seen in terms of no shows or people not coming to the appointment, it's definitely down because they're either a phone call away or they're just they just log in at home in the you know convenience of their own home. So that's probably one positive that I've seen、um, from this. I mean that's that's、yeah. really true. I do have to agree with that. Like my my homeless population, typically they're like all missing all the time. So I'm just driving around for hours for just wasting gas. But definitely with the phone calls, so much better compliance and it, it's a, a lot safer too for me personally. Not going、yeah. out into the field. Yeah. Have、so. you seen anything anything positive? I love it. Um, a lot of positives.、Um, I do like to talk about negatives a lot, but at the same time, there are a lot of positives. <laughs> Um, I work in a crisis stabilization unit, so instead of just being at one place, I'm able to actually be at two different places because they integrated a system where I'm able to see things in both areas. So they do get care faster, and the wait time is or shorter because we are able to patients right away as opposed to patients waiting for us in person and just having to go through steps. I'm able to kind of switch up things and then see them a lot sooner so they can get the care. Uh, a lot faster, or determine if to be transferred to a different hospital. I'm able to talk to different providers, things like that. So that's definitely a positive、um, in that regard. It's not always all negatives.、Um, I think at the end of the day, just kind of how it's going to impact you as a person, and how is it going to impact like your specific field, and kind of just going from there. So let me ask you this: What's the funniest thing you've seen, or where a patient was at when you were having? A telepsych consult or telehealth appointment. Have you seen any funny thing? I I get a lot of people on the bus. I get a lot of people pooing using the restroom. I get so many of these. I Us- using the restroom all the time. Oh wow! <laughs> Are they on mute? All the time. I haven't seen、or、that just, one. I haven't seen that one. They're、yet. just like random places, like <laughs> all the time. It's like, can you just? <laughs> Just tell me pause real quick, and then but no, they just have a whole conversation, twenty thirty minutes on the toilet. I had one client not wear a shirt,、um, but that was the only time、uh, that's ever happened to me. I thought that was a little bit different, but you know. did you tell them to put a shirt on? You know, I did after a couple of minutes because I just said <laughs> it was more appropriate. <laughs> that's all. That's why I came back to. Like whoa. I, I again, like most of my patients, are phone visits only because they don't have smartphones. So I haven't had the privilege. <laughs>、mm, fair enough. Fair enough. So how do you think this is gonna? How do you? What do you see the future as? Like, how long do you think this is gonna be happening for? Do you feel like it's gonna be less than five years, or you think it's gonna be the actual future of psychiatry or mental health? I think it's it's going to be kind of a place, you know. I don't think it's going to be the whole future, but I definitely feel like it's going to have its place now, where it's like you have the options, and I guess increases more flexibility for people, whether it is telephone calls. But then the problem also is like, will insurances reimburse these things? Because the big issue right now is right now they're you know with this pandemic they're reimbursing telepsych appointments, telephone appointments, but it's kind of at their discretion. You know, obviously if you do cash pay, you take cash. Well, then I guess it won't really matter.、Um, but you know, the insurances are kind of dictating. You know if they're going to allow it or not. 
But do you feel like ultimately, unfortunately, that's what it's going to boil down to? Is insurance going to pay for it? Reimbursement. I think with everything, reimbursement. But yeah, I think they'll renew it. I mean, they should. I mean, that would be. They should. Yeah. No, it it improves compliance so much. So many more people are able to get care. So even if it's not like the best, you know, care that you will get from in person, at least they're getting something. Yeah. Yeah, especially outpatient. At least they can kind of deal with it in that sense. Outpatient, what? Yeah, for sure. But do you get scared of prescribing certain medications because you're not able to see a person? Because you know, like when we normally have a patient come into the office, we weigh them, we do their blood pressure depending on what medication they're on, especially new patients and get their height and especially for adolescents and drink. Um, but now it's really hard for us to do that. A lot of it is just like, oh, like how much do you weigh? How tall are you? And then a lot of people <laughs> lie to you because they don't want to tell you how heavy they are. And especially when it comes to like antipsychotics and gain, things like that. Do you guys get, or like ADHD medication, stimulants, get to check blood pressure and pulse and whatnot. Do you like you're more hesitant to prescribe certain ones? because you don't have those uh, different tools to use in front of you to get the vital? Yeah, I mean, I'm definitely more apprehensive in terms of like controlled substances. You know, even before I'm pretty, pretty apprehensive just in general, even in-person appointments, but I'm, I'm definitely more cautious. Um, you know, I know these, you know, the Ryan Hyde Act, Hot Act, Hyde Act, however you, however you say it. Um, how do you say it? Ryan I don't Hyde. know how to say it. Oh, I okay, just, I I, yeah, whatever, I just whatever it is. Hate. Yeah. What is it? What is it, Joyce? How do you say it? I don't know. <laughs> don't ask me. I said it wrong the whole time. I My bad. I didn't say it. I mean, for me, my biggest issue is getting labs for my patients. Because I have so many people, I, again, I mean, just even before this, it was really hard to get labs. But now with everything, it's impossible. But yeah. Yeah. Getting labs is hard. For sure, hey. getting blood pressures, EKGs, I, you know, yeah. but referrals well, to doctors, impossible. Even talking to other providers is nearly impossible. It's like a week turnaround, if that. A lot of emails being sent, a lot of phone calls, uh, voicemails being sent, and still can't get a hold of them. And it's like you just end up having to kind of do things out of the whim sometimes. But labs, it's like. Oh, I know you got your lab done last week, but I'm not able to get a hold of them. Let's just redo your labs. And then they get upset because they already did their labs. They're not able to pay for it or blah, blah, blah. So just, they don't want to be exposed. Yeah. Yeah. It's tough. Tough world out there. Very tough life. I wanted to go back to something you said earlier at Life of Second P. You were talking about nursing schools and nursing students. I wanted to um, also mention that there's an additional challenge for these new grads in that the hospital systems aren't hiring new grads. They only want experienced nurses. Because they're already so short staffed, they don't have the time or resources to train all these new grads. So I think new grads are in a really, really difficult position right now. And I really, really sympathize with them. I have a lot of um, former students asking me like, what can I do to get my name there out there so I can get a job? And all I can say is, I mean, just network, I guess, mm -hmm. because a lot of these places aren't even posting um, listings anywhere, right? It's, I don't know what what have you guys found? Do you guys know anything about that? Any advice that you might have for new nurse practitioners or new grad nursing students? I definitely see the influx of how many people are applying, right? So I did that job posting, and about three or four days, I had fifty three applicants, right? And I would say forty, yeah, four forty of them were probably <laughs> new graduates. It was a lot, and then the rest were pretty, you know, like I guess the other thirteen were experienced, or they were just looking for a second job. You know, ideally, you know, it, it's so difficult, right? Because, you know, you're in such a difficult situation. I mean, having, you know, one one job opening and there's 53 applicants, I mean, it's a tough, you know, you really got to you know, try to set yourself apart. I think I spoke about in the last video, you know, trying to separate yourself. You know, this is kind of even before you get into the program is getting that psych, you know, psych experience. Mm -hmm. That's still number one to me. Um, but I also just think any way you can kind of stand out, whether you're a clinical instructor in mental health or, you know, whatever you can do, just one little thing that, you know, can kind of just help you stand out, you know, or even your cover letter, make it sure it's like completely personable to whoever you're, you know, whatever company you're applying for. Make sure you really try to make it, you know, talk about the mission statement, their values. You, know, you really have to get yourself to kind of stand out because if, if, if this is the way the market is heading and there's this many applicants just for one job, I can only imagine what it's going to be like in a couple of years. And that's, that's, that's like probably a topic for another time. Yeah. 
think another uh, thing that you can do is like for the supportive staff, like obviously within the hospital, that's kind of who rely on, whether it's CNAs, MAs, um, you, if you can get, if you already have like your CNA certificate, um, try that out. I think that's going to be a big thing, being able to kind of work in the actual huddle, show your work as, and be able to talk to management because you're going to end up working with them ways. So just show what you got and you can then transition from there. Um, and just applying everywhere at the end of the day, applying everywhere, numbers game. It's always going to be, it's either a numbers game or, you know, <laughs> yeah. reach out to every single person who you know, because there's a lot of nurses out there. Someone knows someone that can get you the job. So just reach out to everyone. Yeah. And keep your resume current too. I mean, if somebody asks you for a resume, you, you better have that stuff like ready the email to them right away because oftentimes that job is not going to stay there for long mm -hmm. so if they're asking for a resume give it to them like, ask me for to like refer her to some people and i just so happened to know you know the manager of a inpatient psych unit and so i was like okay send me your resume right now and she's like okay okay i will and it's nothing so that's it you know it, these jobs are in so de so high demand like they can't hold it Exactly. So you gotta and, be pre prepared for any opportunity. Yeah, I agree. I think it's tough for nurses too because they're seeing how the current state is and they don't want to be nurses anymore. There's a lot of those people that are apprehensive of actually even wanting to work as a nurse because they want to just be thrown out there and you're not necessarily even learning proper uh, skills that you're going to learn on your youth. So if you're a med surge nurse, on a medical or a surgical floor is like, are you really going to be dealing with surgeries or are you just going to be dealing with COVID or the pandemic? <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like a lot of these nurses just don't be exposed if they have little ones, if they have uh, elder parents and they, they go into nursing because you're kind of sold this dream that you're going to be helping people with so many different variety of uh, disorders, but now you're just focused on one and kind of keeping the person alive and maybe even overwhelmed with uh, more patients that you can handle, especially as a new grad, and they just want uh, to be in that situation. So they out look elsewhere. I've heard a few nurses that tell that, like through DMs, be like, oh, I don't even want to be a nurse anymore. I just want to come somewhere else where I can just have a normal nine to five. I can work from home and not expose everyone else because it's not worth it at the end of the day. Before you guys became psych MPs, did you guys feel like you were starting to get burnt out being a registered nurse, or did you feel like, or were you still, ha I guess, happy or content? I liked it a lot. Um, I was in the ER and then I was in psych, obviously. The ER was always changing. So I'd be dealing with a multitude of uh, different diagnoses, disorders. So I wasn't burnt out at all. Like I was kind of sad actually leaving um, to psych NP. Like I wanted to stay a couple days as a friend, but I knew mono like time-wise and compensation-wise, it, it didn't even make sense to me. Because I worked for county, so I didn't even get paid any as an RN. And then going up to being an NP is just like pretty different. So that's why I was like, I'd rather use my time wisely, especially with my kids, and I'd rather spend that time with them instead of working night shift also. I, I was burnt out, um, but by that point, I was in management, and there was just a lot of politics. Uh, we Our hospital had got bought out by a different hospital system. There's a lot of changes, and people weren't happy. So I think. It was just the overall vibe. Yeah. I mean, even for me, I mean, I wasn't exactly happy anymore. You know, I was working in inpatient psych for my last, you know, my last job. And, you know, I think the stressors of living, you know, where I live in Maryland, Baltimore, in this patient population group, you know, I would get hit in the face. I would have to, you know, it, you know inpatient psych is, is a different beast. Um, and I just think I was just, after that, I was like kind of just tired of everything, you know, and even though I was still wasn't unsure, you know, I knew I wanted to do psych NP, but you know, you never know until you start it because you can, you can think you can read and watch all these videos and until you kind of get in that, that driver's seat and you do it, then you'll fully know, you know, and for me, it was, it was a good choice, but around that time I was, I was pretty ready to kind of get out of bedside. Yeah. Yeah. All right, guys. So, guys, we've been getting a lot of questions in the comments section down below. Um, and the number one question we got was, what is our favorite food? Um, so, the life of a psych and pee, can you just, I guess, you know, tell the audience what, what's your favorite food? Oh, I've been doing a lot of DoorDash lately. And, like, <laughs> like, 
crazy amount, like in the thousands every month. So, number one is going to be sushi. One, poke bowl. Two, Mexican food. <laughs> That's it. Do you have mercury poisoning? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> Wait. Okay. So how does that work? I'm so scared to order takeout sushi. I love sushi, but I'm I'm scared to do takeout. Well, I've been going to these places before pre-COVID, so I'm familiar with like how things run. So that's kind of comfortable with it. Yeah. Second, Pete. What about you? What's your favorite food? I'm a I'm a cheese pizza guy uh, with French fries. You know, I'm a pretty simple guy. It's kind of grew up. You know, Pizza Hut, Domino's, Little Caesars, a little crazy bread. Yeah, you know, that's just how you know how I can stay you know in shape. It's just gotta keep eating the food you love. You gotta enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Joyce? <laughs> um, I love spicy food. Love love, love spicy yeah. food. Yeah. So sushi's up there for me. Ramen, um, curry. What else do I like? Yeah. Anything spicy. Anything spicy. Nice, nice. I'm nice. probably gonna die early. I'm gonna get like stomach ulcers. <laughs> <laughs> all right all right guys so guys on the comments below make sure you know you, you tell us what kind of topic we want to, you know, you want us to speak about and we're going to look and, and we'll kind of discern which one we want to do for the next and video what is and what is your favorite comment down below yeah, yeah give us suggestions hey guys make sure to follow me on instagram at the psych and p on tiktok as well as youtube all right guys i'm trying to give you guys more videos trying to i know i suck at the content but I'm trying to be like the life of a second P down here. I'm trying to be like the curious second P over here. It's it's a tough it's a tough task, but I'm doing the best I can. <laughs> Follow me guys on Instagram and YouTube. Life of a second P. All right, thank you guys so much for watching. Uh, you can find me on Instagram and YouTube at the Curious Psych NP. I just started a brand new series called Curious Psych Roll, so check it out if you are curious about what other kinds of unique psych roles there are in the mental health world. Nice. I'm definitely curious about that. <laughs> Alrighty guys, All right, have a good back. one.